Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. So glad you're with us for the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Got good, bad, and crazy martinis for you today. And Jim, we're mostly talking about Democrats today. We're also talking about the Taliban, but we're going to have the Democrats in the good and the crazy and the Taliban in the middle. I mean, where else would you find the Taliban, honestly? So uh, let's go to our good martini now. And uh, Kirsten Cinema continues to be a pleasant surprise, Jim. Uh, we know that uh, with Joe Manchin uh, putting out his um, preferred revisions to the elections reform bill, which uh, a lot of folks on the right are now referring to the Corrupt Politicians Act, but... Uh, that he's put out his list of what needs to change in order to make it acceptable to him, which would give the Democrats 50 votes, which would then actually require a Republican filibuster to stop it. Uh, the White House has not necessarily signed on to this thing yet, even though people like Stacey Abrams have. Um, but uh, Jen Psaki saying just yesterday, I think, at the White House that, uh, you know, if this doesn't pass, then we'll uh, then we'll be revisiting the process, which is uh, very thinly veiled code for we're going to be talking about the filibuster again, whether that needs to be reformed or killed altogether. But if it's going to happen, it's not going to happen right now because Kirsten Cinema refuses to budge at all. Op ed in The Washington Post, and she says to those who want to eliminate the legislative filibuster, to pass the For the People Act, voting rights legislation I support and have co-sponsored, I would ask, would it be good for our country if we did, only to see that legislation rescinded a few years from now and replaced by a nationwide voter ID law or restrictions on voting by mail and federal elections over the objections of the minority? To those who want to eliminate the legislative filibuster to expand health care access or retirement benefits, would it be good for our country if we did, only to later see that legislation replaced by legislation dividing Medicaid into block grants, slashing earned Social Security and Medicare benefits, or defunding women's reproductive health services? She says this question is less about the immediate results from any of these Democratic or Republican goals. It is the likelihood of repeated radical reversals in federal policy, cementing uncertainty, deepening divisions, and further eroding Americans' confidence in our government. Uh, she says she's always held this position, even when she was in the House. Things are not changing just because she's in the Senate and in the majority now. So, uh, Jim, uh, we can't ask much more than this. I mean, it'd be nice if she was also opposed to some of this legislation. But given the conditions right now, it's more important that she's opposed to uh, budging on the filibuster. And as mad as that seems to make a lot of libs, she's standing strong. So we need to appreciate that. Greg, for all the listeners out there who are like, wait a second, I know I've listened to Jim and Greg talk about <laughs> Kirsten Cinema opposing the filibuster before. Yep. And I'm pretty sure I've heard them talk about Joe Manchin opposing the filibuster before. And I've heard them making the point that without total Democratic unit being Democrats being unanimous, they can't break the tie on a vote for the they can't even get to a tie on a vote like this. So it won't go away. So this is not a rerun. This is actually the episode for June 22nd, 2021. <laughs> this is just an observation that the, the coverage of these of these two Democratic holdouts, and I'll get to more in a second, but you know, the coverage of Manchin and Cinema for like the last six months has been, you say you in the past, you've said you oppose the filibuster, but how do you feel now? And then, you know, after telling Manu Raju of CNN or somebody else, well, no, I still oppose the eliminating the filibuster. Then they say, well, okay, well, that was three seconds ago. How do you feel now? <laughs> and just continuing this process over and over again. It really, At some point, we should move on and say, okay, this is their position. They're not going to do it. Democrats, you're going to have to figure out a way to pass legislation that uh, can get 10 Republican votes or that you know minimizes the, the objections Republicans have to it. That's what happens when you have a 50-50 chamber. Sorry, folks, you did not win a big majority. And you can't even argue that, uh, uh, oh, we're, we're, you know, just a couple of votes close. You guys got it by the skin of your teeth on those two runoffs in Georgia. Uh, now, here's the, the other thing is that NBC News, you know, always first to the story reported what all of us have been saying for months and months, which is that, you know, Manchin and Cinema are the ones you hear about because Joe Manchin represents West Virginia, a state that voted for Donald Trump by an overwhelming amount and has been largely become a Republican state, at least at the federal level. Uh, and it's, you know, very culturally conservative Joe Manchin is the only guy who could represent that state in the Senate and be a Democrat. Uh, Kirsten Cinema, Arizona is a very purple state. It's not that different. In fact, you hear about Manchin and Cinema, but NBC News observed there are at least five other senators who are also 
if not outright opposed to changing the filibuster, let's just characterize them as wary. One of them is Mark, the other uh, Democratic senator from Arizona, Mark Kelly. They go down the list. They mentioned Maggie Hassan of, North, of uh, New Hampshire, John Hickenlooper of Colorado, and two that might surprise you, Dianne Feinstein of California and Patrick Leahy, who just have not said whether they would support abolishing the filibuster. I would not want to bet all of our uh, hopes on, on those two, but I just kind of observe, it's kind of interesting. These are two of the longest serving Democrats in the Senate. They've been around a long time. Maybe they, you know, the reason they're not jumping on and becoming cheerleaders is because they can remember what it was like when they were the minority, you know, six months ago. And they remember that, oh, if we do this, this come back and bite us in the tush the way we did every time we eliminated the filibuster for, for judicial nominations. Um, it's also been fascinating to see if Republicans had control, they'd eliminate the filibuster as if we hadn't just had Republicans controlling the Senate from 2014 to 2020. Uh, so all in all, it's just a good sign. I think it is kind of a, an odd obsession of the media that they keep asking this. Um, is it conceivable that Kirsten Sinema would go back on her word on this? I guess, but man, oh man, uh, would it look bad for her to basically give this, you know, this, this you know, sweeping blanket, no exception statement, and then say, oh, wait, what I meant was I was okay to lowering it to 55 or something like that. No, and it's, uh, I, I think the uh, subtle message here is even if they stop and block a lot of things I would like to become law, I'm not changing. I mean, I, I don't under, understand how you can be more clear than that. Uh, obviously, politicians uh, can change their mind and, and wiggle into a new definition depending on the circumstances. But uh, I, I don't see that happening, at least uh, in, in the immediate future here. And, you know, we were just talking uh, last week when Dick Durbin made that ridiculous comparison to people trying to kill the filibuster being equated to the troops that stormed the beaches of Normandy. Jim, uh, they they hearken back to a clip from 2018 when Trump was asking Mitch McConnell to kill the legislative filibuster, and Durbin was on with George Stephanopoulos, and he's saying, well, this would be the end of the Senate as we know it. I don't remember Manu Raju. I don't remember a lot of other Capitol Hill reporters constantly asking moderate Democrats and uh, more liberal Republicans like Susan Collins, who was opposed to killing the filibuster, uh, well, have you changed your mind? Have you changed your mind? Are we going to kill this thing? Uh, it's amazing how the uh, the priorities and how the questions are framed change depending on who's in charge. They're holding this position is not you know, no one. Kirsten Cinema has said she wants to be the John McCain of Arizona. She's not getting John McCain coverage now, is she? <laughs> you know, John McCain was a hero because he was opposing the rest of the Republican Party. Uh, Cinema is standing up to her own party, and she's seen as some sort of weird outcast who just can't work well with others. Yeah, kind of reminds me of Joe Lieberman with the Iraq War. The guy was uh, very close to becoming vice president of the United States. Then he supports the Iraq War, uh, turns into a a dud of a presidential candidate because of it, perhaps, and then uh, loses his own primary, has to win re-election as an independent, all on one issue. So uh, while the the Republicans who buck the party are heroes in the media, the Democrats who buck the party are uh, are pariahs in the media, and they're absolutely enemies of democracy. So uh, we have to keep in mind uh, the double standard that we're seeing there, clearly. But, you know, uh, at least you can uh, rest easy knowing that uh, for the moment the filibuster is safe. There's another way to rest easy, and that's in the fabulous products from Tommy John. Whether it's the lounge pants, whether it's the underwear, that's the T-shirts, fabulous, fabulous products. And, uh, you know, this summer you want to soak up the sun, not your sweat. And Tommy John underwear is your solution uh, to feeling cool because it's cool cotton fabric is two to three times cooler than regular cotton. With dozens of comfort innovations like breathable, lightweight, moisture wicking fabric with four times the stretch of competing brands, once you try Tommy John underwear, you are never going to go back. That's why Tommy John doesn't have customers. They have fanatics. Hundreds of thousands of them who after 13 years and tens of thousands of five-star reviews, they all call Tommy John the most comfortable underwear ever. And I think they say that because it's true. Uh, Tommy John has absolutely comfortable underwear. The lounge pants are fantastic. I know we got all these TV ads now talking about how we're supposed to be wearing real pants now that the pandemic's coming to an end. Why? I mean, as long as you're working from home and uh, spending a lot of time there still, hopefully, uh, lounge pants, super, super comfortable. And I love the T-shirts, too. Uh, can't uh, can't recommend them enough. And with more than 15 million pairs sold, men across America love Tommy John underwear 
as well. And no one keeps you cool this summer like Tommy John. In fact, if your Tommy John underwear isn't the best pair you've ever worn, get your money back, no questions asked. So right now, get 20% off your first order at TommyJohn.com slash martini. Go to TommyJohn.com slash martini for 20% off. One more time, TommyJohn.com slash martini. See their site for details. All right, Jim, let's move over to our bad martini and, of course, the Taliban. As I mentioned at the top, we've even mentioned this, I think, also in a previous uh, martini, but now we're seeing more and more evidence that what we feared would happen once the U.S. officially leaves Afghanistan is likely to happen, and perhaps in fairly short order. This is from the AP. Taliban fighters took control of a key district in Afghanistan's northern Kunduz province Monday and encircled the provincial capital Police said as the insurgent group added to its recent battlefield victories while peace talks have stalemated. The Taliban's gains came as the Pentagon reaffirmed the U.S. troop withdrawal was still on pace to conclude by early September. Fighting around Imam Sahib district began late Sunday and by midday. Monday, the Taliban had overrun the district headquarters and were in control of police headquarters, uh, according to the provincial police spokesman there. And so, Jim, we're seeing this in a number of parts of Afghanistan, so far usually in sparsely populated areas. But it's pretty obvious that what the Taliban's plan here is. They're doing what they can already. They know the U.S. is planning to leave. There's hardly anything I can imagine that'll happen that'll that'll make us stay at this point. And they know that once we're gone, they have their chance to uh, topple the current government, which uh, largely still exists because of our support. And uh, that could put them in a position not only to be back in power and making everyone's lives miserable again, rolling back uh, educational progress, another thing for women, but also potentially creating a safe haven for terrorists. So the handwriting on the wall here is in bold letters. Greg, you and I have talked about Afghanistan on this podcast for a lot of times over many years. And look, there's no no denying this is a thorny issue. There's a lot of American exhaustion with this. It's very tough to argue uh, that there's going to be something dramatic that will change from the U.S. involvement in the 21st year uh, of the U.S. military presence that couldn't be changed in the past 20 years. Uh, and I was among those who kind of felt like, well, it, you know, we, we hadn't had any casualties for almost the entirety of 2020. It really doesn't really count, you know, meet by most people's concepts of a wartime deployment. There would really be very little harm and probably a great deal of good that would you know, come from having a small presence, say maybe 2,500 guys, remaining in country at Bagram Air Base or the, the airport as a you know, counterterrorism mission. Unfortunately, when you see this and you see the sheer number of provinces who have essentially fallen to control of the Taliban without a fight and turned over their equipment and turned over their arms to the Taliban, I am reluctantly coming to the conclusion that maybe there's just no point in keeping a U.S. presence there because we can't want a free and independent, uh, non-Taliban ruled, non-brutal uh, throwing acid in the faces of schoolgirls. Uh, Afghanistan more than the Afghan people do, and in particular, the men of Afghanistan. If they're not willing to stand up, protect their women and children, they can't count on us to do this anymore. We've spent 20 years equipping their military, training their military, doing everything conceivable to turn them into a modern state, and apparently the whole thing is falling apart like paper mache that's been left out in the rain. Deeply depressing, and it kind of leads to the argument that, yes, this is not a country that can, can be, you know, even come close to being fixed by outsiders. It is likely to return to Taliban rule. Maybe next time, you know, it, we'll see if the Taliban, there's no indication Taliban has uh, given up its ties to Al-Qaeda. The question is if the U.S. has to go back at some point in the future and how we will, because it certainly will not involve 20 years of attempting to rebuild this culture in this country like it was since 2001. We are now less than three months away from September 11th, which is not only the 20th anniversary of 9-11, but the target date that the Biden administration has set for the total withdrawal of American forces from Afghanistan. And I I don't believe that uh, much is going to change in terms of that. One thing I've heard some folks uh, concerned about, and I don't think it's gotten a ton of media attention, is what happens to the Afghans who helped us, assuming the Taliban actually ends up in power, whether it's regionally or nationally. There's thousands of people who are either informants or allies or interpreters, many different roles over there. And the Taliban knows exactly who these people are. They just can't touch them right now because we're there. And once we're gone, what's going to happen to these people? So there is a small push, at least as far as I can tell, underway to help these people escape while we still have a presence there or else they're going to end up slaughtered because if they don't uh, get some sort of uh, help in getting out of there, that's going to get really ugly and it's going to make it even harder to find friends the next time we have to go somewhere in that part of the world. 
All right, let's talk about another great sponsor of the Three Martini Lunch here, a brand new sponsor, the Wild Alaskan Company, and it's all about awesome seafood. Look, you're used to having a lot of choices when it comes to what you eat, but it also matters where that food comes from. You can get your nutrition from nature. The Wild Alaskan Company sources wild-caught seafood from Alaska and the Pacific Northwest, and the range of options here is fantastic. You can go all the way from from lobster to uh, regular fish. Uh, we are eagerly awaiting our box at the Corumbus household. We uh, put in a specific request for lots of salmon. Uh, Mrs. Corumbus, unfortunately, has a shellfish allergy, so there's a lot of options here that uh, that we're not going to get access to. But we're very, very excited about what is going to be coming here and uh, finding out just how great this seafood is from Wild Alaskan because, I mean, how much better can you get than, uh, than seafood caught up there where everything is about as fresh and pristine as it can possibly be. So if you want the best possible seafood from the best place to get it on Earth, you definitely want to check out the Wild Alaskan Company. Wild Alaskan Company delivers high-quality, sustainably sourced, wild-caught seafood right to your door. You can choose from salmon, whitefish, or a combination, and every month there are different specials to explore. Each shipment contains premium, wild-caught, individually wrapped portions of delicious seafood that's ready to prepare and easy to cook. And Wild Alaskan Company seafood is how nature intended it to be. Always wild, never farmed or modified, and it contains no antibiotics. Fantastic. You can adjust, pause, or cancel your membership anytime, and they offer 100% satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. Get your nutrition from nature with the Wild Alaskan Company. And right now, you can get $15 off your first box of premium seafood when you visit wildalaskancompany.com slash martini. That's wildalaskancompany.com slash martini for $15 off that first box. wildalaskancompany.com slash martini. Make sure to use our URL to let them know that we sent you and, of course, to save money for yourself. All right, Jim, there's an old saying as we enter our crazy martini here. I may have been born at night, but I wasn't born last night. And the Democrats, at least a lot of them, seem to think that we're going to fall for their latest ridiculous ruse when it comes to election reform. That was kind of the premise of Kirsten Sinema's op-ed in the Washington Post about why she's not going to budge on the filibuster, even for that legislation. But as a result of Joe Manchin uh, putting forward these reforms, one of them is nationwide voter ID. And anyone who's paid attention over the last decade or more knows that the Democrats have lit their hair on fire over voter ID, calling it racist and it's voter suppression, even though the data from every election since then shows voter turnout has been uh, fantastic. And certainly in the latest few cycles, uh, minority turnout's been been higher than ever. And so now that Joe Manchin uh, could potentially get them to 50 votes in the Senate, Kamala Harris breaks the tie, and then they could blame the Republicans for blocking it and possibly start a big fight over the filibuster. All these Democrats, including Raphael Warnock, uh, the new senator from Georgia, saying that, well, sure, we're for voter ID. We were never against voter ID. What are you talking about? Uh, Here's what uh, Fox News reports. Senator Warnock claims he has never been opposed to voter ID laws, but a Fox News review of Warnock's past comments found that he has been a fierce opponent of voter ID requirements. Quote, I have never been opposed to voter ID, he told NBC News in an interview published on Thursday. Quote, and in fact, I don't know anybody who is. Who believes people shouldn't have to prove they are who they say they are? But what has happened over the years is people have played with common sense identification and put into place restrictive measures designed not to preserve the integrity of the outcome, but to select certain group. And so, I mean, he's talking about driver's licenses, really, here. I mean, that's obviously really burdensome. Uh, But over to hot air now, has anyone explained to Senator Warnock that there's this thing called the internet where the videos and transcripts of public figures are kept in perpetuity? Going all the way back to 2012, Warnock gave a sermon where he denounced, quote unquote, unnecessary and unjustifiable voter ID laws that are an affront to MLK's legacy. In a 2015 sermon, he claimed that voter ID laws were not about voter verification, but voter suppression. The following year, he scoffed at the need for such laws, saying it's hard enough to get people to vote once to say nothing of twice. Not really sure what that is in reference to. But, uh, Jim, I mean, you and I have talked about this a lot. Eric Holder was blocking uh, 
voter ID requests from uh, southern states uh, for a while there while he was attorney general. The uh, the polls are obviously showing the vast majority of people are in favor of voter ID, so maybe that's why they're budging or they think this is their, their last chance to get their signature piece of legislation done. But what do you make of the Democrats trying to gaslight us here? Well, Greg, you... You, you made the point about the polling, and it is worth noting that earlier this week, Monmouth University came out with a new national poll. Look, it's not just Republicans who like this. Support for requiring a photo ID to vote is supported by 62% of Democrats, 87% of independents, and 91% of Republicans. As I noted to Hugh Hewitt earlier this morning, Greg, I want to know who are those 9% of Republicans who oppose <laughs> requiring photo ID to vote? But yeah, when it's well above majority support amongst Democrats, you know they're in a unpopular position. But the polling has been pretty consistent on this. It's not like support for photo ID just suddenly surged in the last you know week or two. So I, all up on it, hot air had a really kind of intriguing way of looking at the Democrats are genuinely playing a three level chess here. Uh, and by the way, there is a strong element of we have always been at war with East Asia when they claim, oh, no, we've always supported voter ID. By the way, going any further, I should point out there is one minute molecular level concern about the requiring photo ID to vote um very easily overcome which you know if you have a driver's license as most americans do i suspect most listeners to this program do you don't really think about the rigmarole it takes to go and get your driver's license and, you know you go and renew you stand in line at the dmv and for you it's kind of fine or, or you know getting a passport application you know getting that first photo id can be a pain in the neck and if you're someone who's not uh patient or really astute of dealing with government bureaucracies it can trip you up so the obvious answer is Yes, we should require a photo ID for everyone who wants to vote and everybody who's legally eligible. But if you're legally eligible, we should make it fairly easy to get a photo ID. And they should you know, wait, be, be able to waive the charges for processing if you can't afford them and things like that. We don't want someone not being able to vote because of problems in obtaining a state ID. That said, the state needs to have some sort of ability to verify you are who you say you are. And almost every state in the union has some version of a provisional ballot idea where basically you go to the, the, the election day, you go to your polling place, you don't have ID, you can't verify that you are who you say you are, you cast, you, you cast what's called a provisional ballot and you've got like three days to go and figure out some way to prove that you are who you say you are and you live in the district and things like that. Um, this was probably the biggest concession to Republicans in, the, uh, in Manchin's compromise proposal. Now, it's worth noting, he also was going to allow you to have a utility bill uh, as proof of ID that you live where you say you do. And I think I'm not sure every Republican's completely on board with that. We can argue about the details of this. But in exchange, basically, this is going to wipe out all state level <laughs> requirements. And also, by the way, it was going to completely take redistricting out of the hands of state legislatures. This has never been a problem for Democrats back when Illinois was drawing all kinds of state legislature, uh, all kinds of legislative lines. But now the whole idea was to eliminate redistricting in an exchange. Republicans would get a photo ID. Republicans still don't like it. They obviously think this is a, you know, they, they're going to lose a lot more through by taking redistricting out of their hands than they're going to gain through the photo ID requirement. They're going to reject it. And the idea amongst Democrats and the thinking of a Stacey Abrams and, and the Raphael Warnocks of the world is to say, OK, we'll give you this on photo ID because we kind of knew this was a fight we were going to lose anyway. We always knew this was, you know, we, we, we could read a poll, too. We knew this, we, you know, we knew this was only a, a good position from the viewpoint of the Twitter left. And in exchange, we're going to, you know, we're going to sign on with Manchin's idea. Manchin's going to put it forward. Republicans are going to reject it. And once Republicans reject Manchin's compromise, maybe then he'll change his mind on the filibuster to kind of take us full circle on our three martinis of today. And, you know, I don't think it's going to shake out that way, but that may be the strategy going on here. Or it may be Democrats kind of deep down recognizing you know, steadfast opposition to photo ID really muddies the waters on their argument of, oh, we're the party that's standing up to the vote, uh, standing up for the right to vote. And Republicans are mean and horrible and trying to prevent people from voting. Well, I, I'm glad they are finally seeing the light. I think it's obviously for, you know, strategic purposes uh, rather than what they actually believe here. But I'm still very much opposed to elections being orchestrated from Washington. I think if elections uh, have consequences on the federal level, they ought to have uh, consequences on the state and local level as well in terms of redistricting. I don't think that's a bad thing at all. And I think states and localities should still run their elections. So while I appreciate the fact that they're conceding on voter ID, it doesn't make the bill palatable, at least to a lot of folks on the right. And so we're still going to have the showdown 
uh, on the filibuster, um, or at least the the showdown on the vote, and then uh, the Democrats crying about the filibuster while Mansion and Cinema hopefully don't budge. So, Jim, fun day as always. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Columbus, Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Uh, please do subscribe to the Three Martini Lunch podcast if you don't already. Tell your friends about us as well. Super grateful for your five star ratings and your kind reviews. Get us on those home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch podcast. Follow us on Twitter. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a great Tuesday, and please join us on Wednesday for the next Three Martini Lunch. Hi, it's Dana Lash, host of The Dana Show. Every day, I'm here to keep you up to speed on the most important stories and info that you need to know in your very busy life. And if you're always on the go and you want to stay connected, just download our daily podcast and take it with you. It's a great way to get up to speed on what you need to know and what legacy media may not be telling you. Visit danaradio.com and click on the podcast link or subscribe at iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts.